Cypress Development Corp is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is Steve Suretsky. He's a Vancouver-based realtor. You can find online at stevesuretsky.com. Welcome back to the show, Steve. Thanks for having me on. Steve, Toronto reporting that their rental construction is at a 50 year high is that a a national situation where we're seeing a lot of rental construction or is it just a toronto phenomena uh i know it's a a national phenomenon um i think rental construction is at all-time highs or not very very close to it uh well you know about toronto uh vancouver here as well is is record uh, number of uh, apartment rental apartment buildings under construction as well. So yeah, that's a rental boom. I think that developers are, are realizing that this is a need and CMHC has sort of changed their structure to sort of begin to incentivize um, development of rental buildings. And so that's where they've been focusing a lot of their attention on, which I think is a good thing in the long run. Does that cut into the uh, properties for purchase or is this just because there's such a demand for rental property right now? Uh, well, I mean, the Units under construction, I believe across Canada as well for for ownership. So condo condominium units, uh, I think those are at record highs as well. So there's a there's a good mix being built. But I think that obviously you know when when prices are as high as they are, um, the reality is is a lot of people can't afford them, and that you know these people, whether they want to or not, they they should be renting. And I think that uh, that's certainly what the government is trying to lobby. And certainly, CMHC is proposing is that. You know, rental can be a good second, uh, you know, alternative option. Uh, we just have to make it a realistic alternative option. So we have to create and incentivize rental, purpose built rentals, um, uh, you know, as, as a means of, of an alternative. Now, the BC provincial government said it expected to see building permits decline by a third over the next year or two. Is that bad news for people who want to buy affordable housing? Uh, well, I mean, obviously more supply tends to, you know, if you can flood the market with supply, generally speaking, that should alleviate, uh, you know, the upwards pressure on rent and on home prices. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it, it can certainly impact us. I think that the permits are such a lag to stack just because it gets, takes so long for, you know, a building to get approved in, in Canada, particularly in Vancouver and Toronto, um, that, you know, I think if you look at the numbers right now, we have a record number of units under construction. We have a record number of housing starts. So the pipeline for for new supply should be pretty full for the next, uh, I would say, five years. Uh, but after that, yeah, I think obviously when permits start to slow, that is ultimately going to be a drag on future supply. So what's the latest on Canadian housing activity? Yeah, it's been pretty robust. Um, it's kind of surprised a lot of people. Um, we went through, a, obviously, a soft patch towards the end of 2018 into 2019. Uh, I think a lot of that had to do with the shock of higher interest rates. And uh, now we're obviously seeing, I think, a sort of risk, risk-on risk behavior again, uh, where you know, there's obviously a lot of speculation going on in Toronto, um, we're seeing some renewed activity in Vancouver as well, particularly at the low end. And, um, yeah, I mean, if you look at sales, they're hovering above 10-year averages. I think the real catalyst, though, is, and what's really not getting a lot of attention, is new listings in Canada, I believe, are at a 10-year low. So despite an increase in the overall housing stock, increase in population, new listings shouldn't be this low and so basically what it's telling me is this, for whatever reason people aren't selling their homes um, again with prices in most cities being at record highs you could certainly argue that that might be a good time to cash out um, but what we're seeing is basically 
people aren't selling, and um, that's creating um, a lack of inventory, available inventory for sale, and that's putting upwards pressure on price. So, um, again, that could easily flip the switch, but I think a lot of that has to do with, you know, uh, the behavior of, of not only homeowners, but of investors who basically hoard housing, hoard assets. And, that, you know, I mean, that could be an ultimately a function of low interest rates where, well, what is the alternative to putting that cash? Um, I mean, very, very low returns in, in most uh, of the safer assets. So I think people are naturally holding on to housing as a result. I think that's creating some supply issues. Mm-hmm. Are real estate listings likely to increase during this year? Uh, I think that's a hard one to, to gauge. I think that, uh, again, a lot of it comes down to behavior. I think, obviously, we have a record number of new supply that is coming closer and closer to completion. And so we should see the number of completed new home units probably hit close to ha- close to new highs this year. So that could certainly help with new listings coming onto the market. But, um, yeah, I think in terms of the, at least in the resale market, for whatever reason, people are, are hoarding uh, housing. We'll have more with Steve Soretsky right after the break. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Writers, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the U.S., AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Avon Resources Limited is a gold exploration company with significant projects in British Columbia and the Yukon, trading on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol ABN, and the OTCQB, symbol ABNAF. Surrounded by world-class gold deposits and mines, Avon's 23,000 hectares Forest Kerr Gold Project is located in the heart of the Golden Triangle in northwestern BC. For more information, visit us at avonresources.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Steve Soretsky. Steve, what's happening in the various housing segments from the low end to luxury? Well, so the low end in, is really robust uh, here in Vancouver. So um, I think that's for the most part is, is a lot of across Canada. But the, the low end, you know, the, the affordable segment of the market, we have people basically at full employment coming off uh, relatively decent wage uh, growth. Is that there's a demand for housing. And ultimately, there's a shortage of affordable housing. You know, prices have obviously gone up. Developers haven't really been building affordable supply. They've been building more luxury. That's where the margins are. That's where it makes sense to to build and develop. So there's ultimately a shortage of, quote-unquote, affordable supply. And so what you're seeing is basically, um, here we are, we're starting to see bidding wars again in Vancouver. Um, just uh, things are selling very, very quickly, as long as they're in sort of the Entry level points, mid range points in the market, and then you have your high end of the market, which, in my opinion, is still oversupplied. Uh, I think there's still downwards pressure on prices, and I think there's ultimately a lack of foreign investment that would normally um, be a bidder in that market. Are low single detached home sales a sign that asking prices remain just too high? Yeah. So what we saw in in Greater Vancouver, Metro Vancouver, I should say. So if you look at Greater Vancouver and the Fraser Valley combined, um, if you look at single family house sales, um, in 2018, they hit, uh, all time, uh, two decade lows, 20 year lows, and 2019 just barely surpassed 2018. So if you look at the past two years for single family house sales, um, really been the two weakest years, uh, in, in over 20 years. So I think that's really telling you that Ultimately, there is a, an affordability issue, right? I mean, people can't afford single-family housing, and I think that that uh, is, is ultimately a secular shift towards, I think, multi-family buildings. I just don't think, even if you get a substantial correction here, that single-family homes are ever going to be affordable. And so what you can see is developers are now obviously reacting to the weakness in the market. You had single-family housing starts for 2019. Uh, we're at a seven-year low. And, um, yeah, I mean, if you look at the math, the math is pretty simple. Let's just say, hypothetically, somebody gave you a free plot of land in Vancouver, city of Vancouver, to go build a detached house. 
Um, so you got the land for free and you went and built a house. The reality is it's going to cost you probably about $300 per square foot to build a house in the city of Vancouver. And um, so, yeah, you'd be looking at about $700,000 to $750,000 just to construct a home. So, again, um, I think that is structurally uh, a problem. And I think that structurally and secularly, we're going to see uh, a continued shift towards multifamily housing, condos, townhouses. I think that's the reality moving forward. Now, I recall Vancouver City Council, without any previous warning, said any house could be turned into a duplex that's now been removed. Was that a good plan or was that not thought out well and they should think of something like that but not quite that? I uh, had that. They actually ended up keeping that in. Um, but the uptake in that program just has been... Um, not good, uh, to, to put it in simple terms. I just think that there's really, I mean, again, like the cost of the land and then to then go and build a duplex and you're not really getting much added density. There's just not enough there to make the numbers work for, for a lot of builders to take on the risk. Um, you know, you got to sell these duplexes. Okay. Let's give you an example. Let's say you build a, a duplex on the west side of Vancouver, you're going to buy the land for probably 2.2. You got to build a side by uh, front and back duplex. You're probably going to look at those are probably going to resell after the fact for probably about two and a half a side. So I just don't think there's a whole lot of demand for a two and a half million dollar duplex. And I think that the builders know that. And so there's just not a whole lot of incentive to actually go and build these. So, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's a bad program. I think that the municipalities are, are, are definitely part of the problem. I think that, uh, you know, build, adding more building code permits, regulations, it just adds to the overall cost of building. We'll have more from Steve Soretsky right after this. Engineer Gold Mines is focused on the exploration and development of the historic high-grade Engineer Gold Mine situated 32 kilometers southwest of Atlin, British Columbia. Engineer Gold Mines is fully permitted for surface and underground exploration with the 2019 drill program now underway. Engineer Gold Mines Limited trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol EAU. For more information, please visit us at engineergoldmines.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Steve Soretsky. Steve, in general, are real estate investors buying or selling? I would say in Vancouver, it's probably pretty neutral. I don't think there's any sort of flood of investors, you know, running to get out of the market. I don't think that there's certainly not flooding the market. I think there's kind of a cautious optimism among investors. I think we're starting to see some of them tiptoe back in. We're seeing, you know, at least, uh, I would say developers are kind of investors when you think about it. Uh, we're seeing the, you know, activity pick up in the land market as well. So, Purchasing of, of raw land to to go out and build uh, new development that's starting to pick up, uh, coming off uh, I think near ten year lows in activity there. So uh, yeah, I would say that uh, there's kind of a renewed optimism there, and uh, but I don't think there's any sort of flurry of activity that you had you know back in sixteen seventeen, but sort of a more of a nor more of a normal balanced market where. A lot of the activity is still, in my opinion, being driven by the primary uh, homeowner looking for an end-user house, <clears throat> and that uh, is why we're seeing demand sort of at the low to mid-range because that's where most people can actually pull the trigger, and uh, we're still seeing weakness in sort of the single luxury single-family and in the pre-sale market where you would normally uh, attract a lot of investors. The U.S. is seeing housing starts at a 13-year high. Uh, any chance that Canada could see a boost in housing starts as well? Uh, well? I mean, we've obviously had a huge bump in housing starts over the last few years. Uh, it's certainly possible that, you know, things continue. I think that it ultimately just comes down to, uh, you know, the liquidity that's in the system. I mean, central banks, particularly the Fed, is, is easing aggressively and uh, 
So I think that's kind of put a renewed confidence into the market. You know, every last year, everybody in 2019 was talking about recession, and everybody now feels like those risks are off the table. Again, whether that's warranted or not is up for debate, but it seems to me like people have sort of uh, regained confidence um, and are, are moving ahead. Um, and again, I think that's in large part due to the massive capitulation from central banks. Mm-hmm. BC still has its 20% foreign buyer tax. Is it time to remove that tax? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I want to touch that. I think that's a contentious topic. Uh, you know, I think that uh, clearly something had to be done in 15, 16. I think we waited a little bit too long, and uh, I think that we're certainly going to be dealing with those ramifications for years to come. But, um, yeah, I think politically it's, it's a popular tax, so I don't foresee the government withdrawing that anytime soon. I think that if you look at the polling towards the speculation tax and the foreign buyers tax, both of them uh, have a lot of political support. So I personally don't see those going anywhere anytime soon. Steve, thank you so much for chatting with us. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jim. Appreciate it. My guest has been Steve Soretsky. He's a Vancouver-based realtor that you can find online at stevesoretsky.com. If you have any questions for Steve, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Our YouTube channel is Talk Digital Network. Find us on Twitter at How Street. We're also on Facebook. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.